Thank you, Judith, and good morning, colleagues. It's a pleasure to be together again in person and virtually. I'm Beth Citron, an independent curator and writer working largely in India and bringing South Asian art to North American institutions. And as Jude said, I'm a proud member of the AAMC Board of Trustees. It's a true honor to introduce today's keynote speaker, Tasneem Zakaria Mehta, a pioneering museum director, art historian, writer, and conservation activist based in Mumbai, India. And I've had the privilege to admire Tasneem over many years, so this is really special, um, a really special occasion for me too, personally. Over her extraordinary career, Tasneem has pioneered the revival and restoration of several of Mumbai's most important cultural sites. She conceptualized, curated, designed, and implemented the restoration and revitalization of the Dr. Baudaji Lad Museum, which is Mumbai's city museum and occupies a unique space in welcoming an extraordinarily diverse population to its exhibitions and programs. She's been managing, direct, managing trustee and honorary director at the museum from 2003 to the present, and she curates its exhibition and education program, chairs the academic council of the postgraduate diploma in Indian art history, and oversees the intact conservation lab at the museum. As we'll hear more about, Tasni Mehta has curated 17 solo exhibitions of contemporary Indian artists and has presented a total of 85 exhibitions in collaboration with national and international institutions over the past 15 years. All of this work requires the finest skill, erudition, and judgment in navigating the relationship between India's complex public and private sectors. It, and this can, as many of you know, this can be challenging globally, but perhaps nowhere more so than in a teeming mega city like Mumbai. Beyond the Baudaji Lad Museum, Mehta was the vice chairman of INTAC, the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage from 2010 to 2017. As convener of the Mumbai chapter of INTAC from 1996 to 2018, she prepared the management plan for Elephanto World Heritage Site, the World Heritage Site submission to UNESCO for Victoria Terminus, and has led several important restoration projects in Mumbai. Mehta has served as an advisor to many of the leading cultural institutions in South Asia. A small selection of these includes the Bangladesh government on the Banga Bandhu Museum in Dhaka, appointed by the Prime Minister's office in 2015, the Advisory Board of the National Gallery of Modern Art from 1997 to 2015, the National Gallery of Modern Art Advisory Council, and the National Institute of Design in Ahmedabad. Among her many notable lectures in India and globally, Mehta represented India at the Google Conference Digital Meets Culture in Florence, Italy in 2017, and at the San Francisco Asian Art Museum Director Summit in 2014. She presented an exhibition of Indian art and was a speaker at two events at the World Economic Forum at Davos in 2010. Mehta has also authored and edited several books. Her latest book, Mumbai, A City Through, Through Objects, 101 Stories from the Dr. Baudaji Lad Museum, was just published by HarperCollins this month and has already received two awards of excellence for design and production and several commendations. Her articles have appeared in the Times of India, Indian Express, and other national and international publications. She's received several awards for her work, including being a voted a Mumbai hero by the Mumbai Mirror. It's a privilege to welcome Tasni Mehta to the AAMC conference, and we're all extraordinarily grateful that she could be here with us in person in New York. And I would now like to invite Tasni Mehta to share her keynote address. Thank you. Good morning, friends. Um, I can't tell you what an honor and privilege it is to be here with all of you uh, and to be able to share the work that we have done in Mumbai on this museum, but for the museum sector generally in India. And I'm really grateful to the AAMC for inviting me to do so and want to congratulate you on the extraordinary work that you do as the AAMC should start to uh, think about becoming global and, and starting something in India and in Mumbai because we really desperately need it. Um, so I have the first slide. So for those of you who haven't really, um, you know, I forgot my glasses. 
så sjukt <laughs> det sa hon ju bara Sorry about that. Um, so for those of you who have never uh, visited uh, India and who don't know Mumbai, because the Bhaudajilad Museum, which is the erstwhile Victoria and Albert Museum, is a city museum, but really when it started, it was an encyclopedic museum. I just want to give you a little context of the city, this incredible city, Mumbai, which is like a sister city to New York, uh, what it's like. So that or what you see on your screens um, is the, the gateway of India. Um, and that next to it is the Taj Hotel. But Mumbai, I'm going to read a little bit and then show you the slides. Mumbai is New York's soul sister, driven by the same desire for success and the lure of the famous pot of gold at the end of the rainbow or a hard day's work. In fact, Bombay, Mumbai's colonial name, was known as the city of gold in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Like New York, it is a city of migrants, established by the British who wanted to develop its deep water port. After the Swiss Canal opened in 1869, Bombay was literally the gateway to India as it was the shortest route from the Suez and connected by the railways to distant parts of the country. Trade was the dominant imperative, and like other institutions established by the British in India, trade was the primary objective for establishing museums in India. Over time, as India integrated into the discourse of the metropole and archaeology archeo became an important discipline, antiquities were also showcased. That is, whatever was not taken to Britain. Museums in India were therefore a colonial creation that foregrounded the colonial ideology of the times, promoting a European conception of art and interpretation of India and Indian cultural practice. One of the earliest museums established by the British in India, the present Dr. Bhaudajilad Museum, Mumbai, opened in 1857 as the government central museum of natural history, economic products, geology, industry, and the arts. It is Mumbai's oldest museum and the third oldest in the country, and one of the oldest in Asia. In 1858, it was renamed the Victoria and Albert Museum when the British Crown took over the governance of India from the East India Company. So really, we are the elder sister to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Um, and, and, and they happily acknowledge that. In 1975, it was renamed after the eminent scholar and philanthropist, Dr. Bhaudajilad, whose tireless efforts had helped to establish the museum. It comprises an eclectic collection that reflects changing curatorial intentions and historic circumstances. Now, very quickly, that's a sort of give you a little bit of a background about how the museum came about. And again, just to show you the context of the city within which it is located. So this is, again, for those of you who have not visited Mumbai, this is Marine Drive, which is a sort of iconic drive, which connects, it's, it's sort of very much like New York, north, south, and an, an, an island. And this is the main drive that connects the north, south to the north. The south is the area which is the most developed, the historic area. Um, and this is the flyover, which takes you to the museum uh, from South Mumbai. We are sort of centrally located. And you can see some of the historic grain present there, but uh, a lot of it now, and you, uh, Mumbai is becoming a city of flyovers. If you come and visit us in, an, in, in, in the next few months or in the next year or so, you will see it's almost unrecognizable how fast it is changing. But some of this historic grain remains. And this is what is happening in the area uh, surrounding the museum, which was the old historic labor area where all the industrial mills are located, um, which really were 
fueled the development of Mumbai. And here, here you is what these were the kind of houses, and this was the kind of context in early, the early area around the uh, museum. And um, you can see that this wonderful synagogue, the governor's house was right very close to the museum. Uh, the Baikala Club, which was the oldest club in Mumbai. Clubs are a wonderful sort of um, British invention. Uh, and you have, we have many of them in Mumbai. And that is the famous David Sassoon's house in Mumbai. There's a very interesting exhibition on, uh, on the Sassoon's, who were one of the major benefactors of the museum, I think at the Jewish Museum in New York. Um, and here is the museum. It's uh, in, when it was first built, and it's uh, sort of what we call a, a jewel box museum. It's very beautiful, very elegant, um, and this is the this is the the interior. Uh, this is a historic photograph. And in, in the early days, as I was saying, it was an encyclopedic institution, it, like several museums started in the end of the 19th century. A, a cabinet of curiosities, which slowly, slowly, we were like a mother museum. And as other museums took shape, uh, we hived off a part of our collection. So we had great collections of Gandhara and classical art, which the British had started to collect, and were all parked at our museum. And then when the Prince of Wales, which is next, sort of more in the central part, or the southern part, the historic part of Mumbai. Uh, it was hived off and given to them. We gave other objects to other museums in the state. So we were sort of like a mother museum in a sense. And this is the building today. So what happened after uh, independence is that it was thought of as a colonial relic and completely neglected. And the objects also people because the objects were in a decrepit condition, which you will see. The government was not interested. In fact, when I started the project, several government officials said to me, why don't you send back these statues and all these objects and ask for our objects to come back from them? We can do a little bit of a swap. So there, there was no real understanding and appreciation of what this museum and its importance historically after independence, the museum was neglected as a colonial relic and was in a derelict condition. The museum, Municipal Corporation of Mumbai that owns the museum was persuaded to enter into a public-private partnership in 2003, the first for a museum in India, and to establish an autonomous trust to manage the museum. This extraordinary initiative took place at a time when conservation was a little known science in the country and when museums were forgotten and forlorn institutions. So when I started the project, uh, one of the senior people in the municipal corporation said to me, uh, couldn't figure out what was this young woman uh, who came from an educated background, what does she want to do with museums? Why museums? He said to me, museums are graveyards for objects. What do you want to do with this museum? and say, OK, I'm going to understand this period. I'm going to see if I can remember every painting. And what. And that is how my love for museums really started. The story of the museum's restoration and revitalization is without precedent in India. The Mumbai chapter of INTAC, the Indian National Trust for Art and Cultural Heritage, which is the foremost cultural conservation organization in India, conceptualized, designed, curated,
and that you might do something because you just love it and you feel passionate about it. And, and so they were trying to figure out what my agenda was. They thought that maybe I wanted to get into politics and this was a backdoor way of getting into politics. Uh, uh, I'm just giving you these little nuggets as we go along. Rajiv Gandhi, so one of the reasons it was successful also because Rajiv Gandhi the, uh, was the prime minister of, of, of India at the time, was chairman of the trust, of the National Trust. It had been started by his mother, Indira Gandhi, um, it, because she was very devoted to art and culture and she was deeply concerned that uh, a lot of the monuments that were unlisted were being demolished and were not getting enough care. The restoration included not only the museum building and its surroundings, but also the revival of the institution. This included establishing a range of facilities like a conservation lab, an education center, a special exhibitions gallery, upgrading the library, creating a museum shop and cafe. I raised 50% of the funds required for the project from the Jamna Lal Bajaj Foundation and the Municipal Corporation contributed the balance. <clears throat> So when I was raising funds, it was not easy. I'd gone to several uh, donors and they, nobody wanted to work with the government. They were suspicious of, of the government. So we started, I'm not going to name people, but we started, we went a long way with a very important business house. And then they were doing some garden or something with the municipal corporation. And I think the municipal corporation were, gave them a hard time in the garden. So they backed out of the project. And two years, three years of trying to get them going and get them interested, I started all over again. And this time it was because we had done Elephanta. I had worked on Elephanta and that was hugely successful. If, if, for those of you who don't know Elephanta, it's the sixth century, incredible, incredible caves um, hewn out of single piece of rock in, in just in the harbor of Mumbai. And that was also in a derelict condition and UNESCO threatened to delist it. And so we worked on it and I put up a site museum there. And that's how I came to the second donor because the second donor saw the work and the Jamna Lal Bajaj Foundation. And we were able to persuade him, uh, Rahul Bajaj, who you will see that this, this was an important project. Again, the government had not realized that really the museum, the archive was a documentation of the development of the city and it had to be um, presented as a city museum, which, which I was able to do. So to, it was rethinking what would appeal, what would grab them, how can I persuade this big industrialist to give, them, give, give us money to do the restoration and I had to sort of do a complete repositioning of what the museum was from a colonial Victorian Albert Museum relic to no, this is a museum about us, about people of India, as you will see, about the people of India, people of Mumbai. All of India came to Mumbai because Mumbai, as I said, was the city of gold. And, and it was the cultural and economic powerhouse uh, especially in the 19th and early 20th centuries, you had to go through Mumbai, uh, through Bombay at the time. And in a way it still is, it still is a sort of uh, an incredible powerhouse. And so to, to, to persuade them that this was really a city museum and we needed it, needed to present it. And that's what grabbed the sponsor. That's what they really liked. Um, uh, it was a greenfield project. The clerical staff um, running the museum were repatriated to the uh, to the municipal corporation, and you will see why when you see the what the slides. We hired new staff, trained them. I wrote the acquisition, HRD, exhibition, and education policies. I set up all the SOPs for the basic museum tasks, like opening and closing the museum, and many many other such uh, such operations. We put together a website which was used by Apple as a landing page and many such initiatives that did not previously exist. The trust board consists of eminent experts uh, from not just Mumbai, but from across India. The donors have a couple of representatives and the representatives of the municipal corporation. The mayor is the chairman 
and the municipal commissioner is the co-chairman. One of the conditions of the donors was that the newly created museum trust be given autonomy to enable it to function effectively. However, the government insisted that they would retain the veto vote on the board. Most museums in India operate under government auspices as, and they're like government departments and most are run by bureaucrats. This is really the tragedy of museums in India, which we're trying very hard and I've been writing articles and I've been trying to persuade uh, them that to change that. But you see, it requires a whole mental change of attitude and, and an understanding of museum potential. I have to say that um, our prime minister now is very interested in museums. And so he has been trying to push uh, uh, museums. But it's you ne need to strengthen the ecosystem. Where are your curators? Where are the people who will understand conservation? You know, so that that's the problem. I'm on there, this new India museum that is being constructed on the, the whole of the of central Delhi has been realigned and reworked. It's called Central Vista, and there are going to be these two huge museums, which are called India museums. And I've been invited by the government to be on the India Museum Committee. But the problem is, they want to do, they have the money, they want to do it, but the ecosystem doesn't exist. There are, where are the university courses teaching art history? You know, so that is, and, and, and the ability to curate, to understand how to curate exhibitions. So that, that, that has been part of the problem. Um, and I'm going to quickly take you through now and show you the restoration slides. <clears throat> so this is the restored museum. It's what is called, uh, it's what is called a, a jewel box museum. Um, it's small, but it punches way above its weight. Um, we won the award of excellence for the restoration. It was a five year restoration. Very quickly, I will go through the restoration slide and give you a sense of what the project was and how it began. Uh, on the left, you can see what it was like before, like a haunted house. <laughs> <clears throat> here you see again the interior and then after restoration and here a lot of the de design details were effaced because it was the erstwhile Victoria and Albert Museum and very similar to the Victoria and Albert the intention was to focus on design um, also because and that that is I'll, I'll talk about it later but because they did not the British did not think that Indian art merited being in museums. They did not think that Indian artists uh, had the refinement or the intellectual ability to produce great paintings or sculpture. So this is, a, this is the museum. And a lot of this was imported from uh, uh, Britain. <coughs> and that is the uh, Minton tiles. And there are these beautiful cast iron railings, which all have v &A in the center. And they, they're these ugly, when we came to it, there were these ugly uh, wiring, right, snaking right across the building. And we recessed all of that. And we, I did a lot of research on lighting systems of that period. And here you see that the um, display was also completely retrofitted. We put in lighting, but we wanted to keep the historic character of the museum intact. So we didn't get rid of the cases. We kept the cases. We did a lot of uh, research on whether we needed, what kind of temperature control we needed and whether um, we needed air conditioning in the museum. <clears throat> and because Mumbai has a very small variation in temperature, we don't, we have a very mild, barely a winter, a hot, really hot uh, summer, but the variation in temperature is about six to eight degrees. So that was not sufficient. The big problem is the humidity. Uh, and therefore, we had experts come in and guide us on this. And they said, if these objects have survived 150 years, you're OK. They'll survive another 150 years. So here you can see some, some of the other cases, how we've retrofitted, tried to bring in a certain transparency, put in a lot of labels. And this is on the, on, on the your left is what it was before and on the right what it is now and this these are the cases of the people of india uh, this this wonderful collection that is almost the usp of the museum 
<coughs> which was just relegated to the back. You can see how they were squished up in a small case. I took them out, put them at the center of the of the upper floor in this very grand, the grandest case that we have, uh, to make a statement about people and communities. And here, this is the regiment's case. Just very quickly going through to give you a sense of the restoration. You can see a video online uh, on our website. And also, this gives you a sense of the kind of objects that we, we have in the museum, the really beautiful objects made by master craftsmen of the in the 19th and early 20th century. And here, before and after of miniature painting, a beautiful Persian miniature painting, we have this wonderful collection of sea craft from, and, and boats in, in the Mumbai harbor. And you can see the condition on the left. Of course, paintings, early modern, uh, paintings, these were also in, in a very poor condition, though these early modern paintings were collected after independence. <laughs> textile, a wonderful textile collection, uh, and a wonderful carpet collection, which this carpet, in fact, is a similar one in the Met. It was, had a huge hole the size of a man, and we brought in, and you wouldn't be able to tell now, we brought in Kashmiri craftsmen, work, weavers from Kashmir, to, and they worked six months on this, and um, we imported yarn from Iran because we couldn't get the colors in India, the exact colors. And uh, and we have this beautiful carpet now. And in fact, when I started the project at the museum, the the the, the curator, the so-called curator who was running the museum, really a clerical staff who they had upgraded to, to the position of a curator, um, he said to me, this is gone. We should just deaccession it. I said, no, 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 we can do something about it. Um, so, and this this is the great John Forbes Watson collection, which some of you may know, 19 volumes about textiles in India. It was in a horrendous condition. We restored all the 19 volumes. Um, and these are manuscripts. This is Tibetan manuscript, uh, which is, um, which were all warped, and we've worked on these as well, though there are some remaining to do. This figurine collection, clay figurine collection, which I was telling you about, these miniatures, um, which were sent to the great exhibitions to showcase what life in India was like. So like the panoramas, then they had these dioramas, which uh, which we, we have several of, because these were similar to the ones that were sent. So one set would be sent to the great exhibitions, and they ended up at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and one set would remain with us <clears throat> and you can see on on the left is uh the the a fungus ridden model and after restoration and here a beautiful diorama of a mughal miniature painting uh, of the emperor jangir on shikar and it was it's, wa it's washed out and here as i was saying is a green it was a greenfield project we had to hire people a lot of people who had no training in museums who had no understanding of how how to what museums were to train them but they were very enthusiastic and in fact i'd worked as a docent i didn't know how to run a museum really i read the icon books i went i worked we worked very closely with the vna season I try to understand them and modify them for our requirements and the, this wonderful really wonderful museum staff that a lot of the success I'm the face of the museum but a lot of the success is the museum staff and they have gone it gives, gives me great pleasure and it's very gratifying to say that two of these staff have become museum directors in India now um, and this the tall gentleman that you see Amar, who is standing close to me, he runs the Vancouver Biennale. Um, and the other gentleman, a little to, to my left, uh, um, uh, is now a senior curator at an institution in Dubai. So it's very, it's wonderful that they have gone on to, to uh, build institutions themselves. So as I was saying, the the the, it, it, the 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 intention was not just to restore the museum. The restoration was the first part of it. it was to bring the audiences in, to convince the government to give us money. It it was the starting point. The purpose was really 
can we provide a platform for uh, artists to do exhibitions? Can we do research and re reinvigorate this museum and, and make it the uh, cultural uh, uh, educational institution that museums are and make it exciting? Um, museums in India have always been perceived as dowdy, dreary places, which as an official one said to me, were seen as graveyards for objects. We wanted to change this stereotype that was pervasive at the time. We sought to engage audiences through art and culture in a conversation not just about our history and heritage, but also about contemporary social circumstances in ways that was inclusive and discursive and not didactic. In, the late 1990s and the early 21st century, when the project began, dialogues and debates about art and even more so about modern contemporary art were few and far between in the limited fora for cultural exchange at the time in India. There was no museums showcasing contemporary art. And even today, the only museums doing so are a few private ones. After much protest from the artist community, for a brief period, the National Gallery of Modern Art in Delhi and in Mumbai, with which I have been associated for 20 years, presented a few artist retrospectives. But since 2014, it has again reverted to a more modernist focus. In its original conception in the 19th century, the erstwhile v &A Museum was intended as an encyclopedic institution with a strong focus on artistic innovation to encourage trade as India was showcased at the international world fairs as the jewel in the British crown. Its original collection was similar to curiosity cabinets of the time and included natural history and geological specimens, as well as gifts and archeological finds. Later, this expanded to include beautifully crafted dioramas and clay figurines that highlighted the life and culture of India in the 19th century. It also includes paintings, rare books, manuscripts, textiles, and an extraordinary collection of decorative arts executed in an early modernist style and made by some of India's finest master craftsmen. Curatorial intentions changed over the years, but the museum was always a place to showcase artistic experimentation, whether in art, architecture, or design. The museum, like the VNA, very similar, had a close relationship with the School of Art. The curator of the museum and the principal of the, of the School of Art were the same person. It was therefore daunting to reinvent a colonial museum and represent it as a modern institution and not just typically, uh, not just a typically ethnographic colonial museum with the intention to explore and redefine these histories through contemporary cultural practice. Over the years, the collection, which had never been researched and had got jumbled up, and for example, the figurines that I showed in, in the presentation earlier, showing the different communities of India were relegated to a small case at the rear of the upper floor and were labeled as costumes of India, very typical 19th century terminology. I recurated this unique collection for more important political objectives, which was to show the great diversity of India and the extraordinary cosmopolitan traditions of the city. In our new book released on the museum building's 150th anniversary last year, titled Mumbai, a City Through Objects, I have specifically looked at this collection through a post-colonial lens and explored how identity was manipulated by the colonial regime in India in an effort to maintain dominance. So I would recommend all of you men get the book if you can. It's on Amazon. And also because I think much of the collection came from the great exhibitions and Many museums in America, in Europe, in Australia were collecting from these great exhibitions. So there's a possibility that there are objects in, in your museums, which are also from India, and you might find them, you find the research in the book useful. At the center of our endeavor was the intention to give primacy to the Indian artists and craftsmen who were responsible for building for the building and the objects, but who had been denied recognition in the museum during colonial times. The miniature figurines of craftsmen who made the objects were presented as central to each vitrine. They were given pride of place and are labels and research 
emphasize this. A similar attention to both the historic intention and how we might interpret the content and the objects in the light of new research and our post-independence, post-colonial position has guided the curatorial mandate for the museum's historic and contemporary art exhibitions and education programs. Central to the program has been the idea of destabilizing notion, notions of identity and dismantling the structures of knowledge upon which the museum was grounded, while at the same time working within the ambit of its original intentions of experimentation and discovery. George Birdwood, the first curator of the erstwhile V&A Museum, Bombay, was an important Victorian esthete and colonial administrator. He was responsible for almost single-handedly articulating the aesthetic canon that would define Indian art for the Western imagination, as well as determining the museum's collecting policies and ex exhibition strategies. George Birdwood also curated the India collection for the V&A. He went on to become the Indian curator at the V&A. These were predicated on, uh, his exhibition strategies were predicated on economic objectives and a prejudiced understanding of both the artist and the craftsman's ability to create artworks or objects considered to be fine art. The Victorian canon privileged the naturalistic representation of subjects above all else. Indian artists worked within a predetermined schema and an idealized representation of subject and narrative. The two canons were diametrically opposite. This disjuncture led to British administrators such as Birdwood and critics such as the British aesthete, aesthetic ideologue John Ruskin to term Indian art as primitive and lacking intellectual refinement. And so they were kept out of museums. Their views unfortunately informed the general perception of Indian art well into the mid 20th century and bedevil the reception of Indian modern and contemporary art in the international arena post-independence for a long time. And it's only some of these ideas are only now being dismantled. Beautiful as the museum objects are, they represent this fraught history and a troubled archived archive that required remediation. I'm just going to take a seat. Our contemporary exhibitions program, which started in 2009, we opened to the public after a five-year restoration uh, in 2008, is the Trojan horse in the museum. The program is structured like a residency that invites artists to research our collections and present a solo show throughout the museum. So sometimes the artists have between 15 to 20, sometimes 25 artworks, which is, which is huge. Making it, they, they, they present a solo show through the museum, making interventions and changing displays in a dialogue with the museum's collection and history. Artists can use objects as part of their artworks and even in some cases reorganize the existing order of display or change the visual perception of the place. In reframing the idea of the museum, it was important to move beyond sentimental conventional ideas of heritage and provoke a con conversation with audiences who had been treated as infantile by the colonial government. The current curatorial intention aims to encourage multiple readings of the collection and the museum's history. The artists and the audience are therefore the centerpiece of the exhibition program in a deliberate political riposte to redress the original political exclusion and excoriation. By reversing the gaze through contemporary visual art practice, the intention is to remember those who had been denied access and whose practice remained unrecognized in the museum, specifically those who were called fine artists, like the early Indian modernists. Uh, I'm going to quickly now show you some of our exhibitions that we have been doing to put this into context. As Beth said, we've done 85 exhibitions. That includes a lot of international exhibitions and other national exhibitions. But I'm going to just show you why 
our contemporary programming and we keep with, as I said, the original intention of experimentation and discovery. And we have a very strong relationship with the School of Art. We've revived that relationship. So Sudarshan Shetty, for example, a wonderful artist, um, is, was, it was from the, Jay had studied at the JJ School of Art. And here you can see uh, Shetty's um, artwork. Um, it was the first major exhibition in 2010, which challenged existing paradigms of display. And Shetty's tour de force, This Too Shall Pass, uh, works had works spread across the museum, breaking down the white cube format, which audiences were used to viewing contemporary art. It was the first time that a contemporary artist's work had been shown in juxtaposition with traditional artworks in a 19th century museum. Each solo exhibition of both established and emerging artists opened new pathways to not only interpret the museum collection, but also simultaneously create new readings of the artist's practice. In the central atrium of of the museum, standing in front of the statue of Prince Albert was a life-size gilded sculpture depicting a topple statue of an artist on a worn out pedestal. So you could see there are many registers of meaning there. Mechanically linked to the statue was a coin box, which would act as a counterweight and would gradually res resurrect the statue as enough coins were put into the box. And so this was a comment on the art world, and it was, you know, the, the statue of the artist Shetty uh, was gold gilded in a suit, you know, making him look very pompous and authoritative. Sort of it was playing off, riffing off Albert, um, uh, but also really the idea of how we elevate authority. And it was a very interactive piece. So people would come with bags full of coins. We would say, we, we donated the money to a charity, um, but they were dying to watch this statue. And it, so, you know, people love this sort of, uh, general audiences love this sort of, and children especially love this sort of interactive stuff. Um, and this is the next work of Shetty, just to give you an idea. It's a, it's a giant gateway. Uh, uh, it's a magnificent oversized cage, like, like a palatial, ent palatial entrance, which entices the viewer with its scale and beauty. Carved on either side is the myth mythical tree of life taken from the famous Sidi Sayed Mosque in Ahmedabad. The entrance beckons while a sword swings menacingly in its recesses, like a pendulum slicing time. It was carved by craftsmen at Mumbai's Crawford Market, um, where there are a lot of antique reproductions are done. So he, the Sidi Said Mosque in Ahmedabad, Ahmedabad, as all of you know, is a city that has experienced uh, terrible colonial uh, um, uh, communal rights. Uh, and, and to take, so in a sense, it's not a, only a comment on mortality, but it is also a comment on communal harmony. And here is the artist Jitish Kalat, who uh, another very highly regarded artist who has had exhibitions at the Philadelphia Museum at the Art Institute of Chicago in May. Biennales, Jitish Kalat curated the first Kochi Biennale. Um, and here you see, and Kalat is also a graduate of the JJ School of Art. Uh, Kalat appropriated the museum's architecture and in, intervened within the display cases, creating new readings of the collection and the museum's history. The, the idyll of the museum stands in sharp contrast to the battle of life that is played out on the city streets and forms the underlying theme of Kalat's works uh, in the museum. So here, there, there is this wonderful scaffolding and you can see he has basically incarcerated Albert. And here, you, the, this is the muse of science and the muse of art on either side of Albert. And the bamboo scaffolding was very deceptive. When you came and you thought, oh, the museum is going through another refurbishment. But when you when you went up close, what he had done is he had 
carved these gargoyles on the surface, which you can see on the surface of the bamboo scaffolding. In a sense, he said he wanted to bring that struggle for life uh, uh, into, the, into the museum and also talk about how the city is constantly reinventing itself. That's why I showed you at the beginning the slides of Mumbai, what it was like earlier, what it is like now, and what it will, God knows what it will become in the future. Um, but it is, it, it has still a lot of the historic grain intact, and we fight very hard to try to keep it. In, in the, and so here, and here you can see some of the gargoyles that he's taken from the Victoria Terminus, which is this beautiful grand uh, terminus, uh, which is a, also a World Heritage Site in Mumbai, built during the British period, about the same time as the museum. In, in his next work, J Jitish has um, taken off from our wonderful figurine collection called Anger at the Speed of Fright. Miniature models created by the artist invert the representation of Mumbai's, Mumbai presented in the colonial times through the beautiful but prescriptive clay figurine collection representing the communities of Mumbai. So these are all beautiful models, very tame, very sedate, very sober about what, what art was like, uh, uh, what life was like <clears throat> in the 19th century and how they dressed, etc. And what Cullet is showing us is this is a city where riots are very frequent. And you can see uh, here a child looking in great fascination. So this gives you a kind of sense of the kind of radical programming that we did. I've just been flagged that I have little time. So and I have much to tell you. So um, here, we'll just go to the next one. This is Rina Kallet, another wonderful artist who's been at the MoMA and had been again at several biennales. And this is a spider's web, uh, which is on the facade of the museum. And here you see it, the, the detail of it. It was over a ton and engineering feat to get it up. The first time that a public artwork, an artwork that interfaced with the public that you didn't have to come into the museum, but in the plaza in front of the museum, which also you through which you can access the zoo and the botanical garden, uh, you see these wonderful, uh, this amazing piece, which is which people were very intrigued by it. The stamps are with colonial names of streets prior to independence and then the names which have changed post independence. But it is also a, a, a comment on how our lives are dominated by certificates which are stamped that we are completely, in a sense, legitimized by bureaucracy. We can't be people without individuals, without those bureaucratic stamps. And also it was a reference to the archive of the museum, which, which, uh, which, um, which was in, in a derelict condition and like in a, an under cobwebs. This is the artist Danita Singh, which many of you might know. Uh, she had an exhibition at the MoMA. She was on the front page of the um, arts and culture section of the time. Danita's work is about um, dismantling again ideas of what authority is and, and bringing in a public voice. So she, all of these works she encouraged. So as you can see, all the, uh, the frames are empty behind and she taught uh, the boys who manned the museum to be curators and to help the audience that came in to select photographs and then they would place them. So then you would, the audience would create their own museum. And she said, this is, um, this is my museum and I'm the director. So she created this desk where I don't know if you can see clearly and on, on, the, on the desk is a, is a board which says um, director. Uh, so that's Danita Singh. But, and here is her museum bhavan, which it's a takeoff. You see museum bhavan, the word bhavan is very interesting. Every single government office in Mumbai, in, in India has the word bhavan behind it. Uh, and so calling it muse Museum Bhavan is kind of riffing off that term. We have, as I mentioned, a very close relationship with the VNA. I'm going to go very fast now because I have less time. 
very close relationship with the VNA. We have a partnership with them, skilling programs with them. They helped me when we first started the museum and we did a lot of contemporary art. We showed Cindy Sherman and Nan Golden for the first time. We've shown Jeremy Della, Alan Kent. We have lots of international exhibitions and the focus of even these exhibitions, like the one of Jeremy Della and Alan Kane, were on, on, on folk and public. Uh, so that is, we, we are very mindful about what kind of exhibitions we present. We had a wonderful project with the Guggenheim Museum called the Guggenheim Lab. Uh, for three months in the in in the museum, which went out into the city and was trying to understand urban dialectics. Um, and here you can see this is from the some of the workshops that we had with the Guggenheim. Uh, and this is our um, visitor experience. As you can see, most of it is excellent. The blue, uh, some is good. Then. A smaller section is average, and there was a minuscule section which says poor. And usually, the ones that say poor are because the people find that the museum is not air conditioning, <laughs> and it's hot in Mumbai. And here, here, the on the other side, you can also tell that the maximum number of people are local. But we have been increasing the we for the it was unknown in the international uh, and tourist uh, uh, stage, and and now there are many many programs. Um, with with uh, with international uh, museums and with a lot of international visitors. Okay, let me go back to this quickly. Um, there is a common misperception in government and business circles that contemporary art or any art for that matter is an elitist preoccupation and therefore culture gets short shrift in state budget allocations. Our experience has revealed otherwise that most the most actively engaged audiences um, are those who have had little exposure to, to art and especially contemporary art. Um, they want to be a part of the conversation. They don't want to feel that, oh, this is elite. At least in India, it is the case. And we have a register for people to write when they come. And it's very sweet. They stand in line to make to write the comments down. We also give them feedback forms. They Everybody fills in the feedback forms and puts them in the box. There is a real desire to know and to learn. And that's why museums in India are such important institutions. As the museum slowly gained recognition in the city, the visit demographic changed to include a cross section of the community like students, the middle class, the elite, and, and local and international tourists. It has now become a destination visit and is also very popular with the city's youth. It was completely unknown. The Bhaudaji Lad Museum, you said Bhaudaji Lad, they'd say what, where, who? Um, we have been able to achieve and initiate what no other public museum in India has done until now, which was to provide a consistent platform for both modern and contemporary art, as well as historic exhibitions and cult different forms of cultural practice. The museum's permanent collection has been researched and recontextualized um, in the light of new post-colonial epistemologies and through various historic and presented through various historic exhibitions. The program also includes solo and group exhibitions and invites local and international curators. It includes a film forum, video art screenings, music and dance performances, international exhibition seminars, and intensive outreach and education program, exhibitions, publications, and a year-long postgraduate diploma in modern and contemporary art and curatorial practice. Because there wasn't one in India, anywhere in India, on curatorial practice and modern and contemporary art. Modern and contemporary art is seen through the full arc of art history and seen through the Department of Aesthetics or the Department of Anthropology, not art history. A partnership with the Google Arts and Culture has enabled a strong digital footprint. And very quickly, I'm going to take you through some of our slides here, showing you international visitors, and you can see Museum is, we have a huge visitation. Um, and here is Richard Penner, who had come to do a, a Richard Penner was the director of the New York Film Festival, teaches at Columbia University. He gave two brilliant uh, series of workshops uh, on film, Latin American film, I think a Russian film. Here is a modern and contemporary course that I was talking about, which has been eight years in running. 
uh, and this we do a lot of teacher training. And on on the on the left is uh, the um, the police has set up a museum, and they came to us and they said, "Would you please guide us and help us how to set up a museum?" So we helped the police set up their own little museum in Mumbai. And as I said, we're on Google Arts and Culture. And um, here are just some of the visitor responses. This is a drawing with that little boy jumping for joy in front of the museum. Uh, we get these love notes, which is just wonderful. Roses are red, violets are blue. And here at BDL, you can be amused too. <laughs> so, and this is Homi Baba. Uh, I think most of you know whom, uh, who Homi Baba is. Who's, he's also uh, from Mumbai. And what he has written is, thank you for giving me this precious narrative of my own social history. And Tim Barringer, uh, who um, brought several of his PhD students, who, who was head of the Department of Art History at Yale, uh, to see contemporary artists illuminate and critique the collection is to see the history of art come alive. So we've had a fantastic response from audiences. This is the New York Times who said, if you only have an afternoon in Mumbai, head over to the stri striking Dr. Bhauda Jilad Museum. We were uh, on the short list of 10 best contemporary museums in Asia and the book, which I was telling you about. And here, sorry, I'll just quickly go through this. And what is our future plans? What do we want to do? Because we're really small, a jewel box museum. We can't accommodate all our ambitions. So the we had in 2014, we had a international competition uh, for 130 to 150,000 square foot new extend new building and the building um, and all the top architects we had 104 submissions as I said and all the top names applied and you can see we have Zaha Hadid we have I'm Pei, um, and we had uh, we had uh, several others and Stephen Hall the American architect, architect Stephen Hall won the uh, competition and here was very eminent jury, museum directors, Homi Baba. And here is Stephen giving a talk and explaining his project to a 500 strong audience. And this is it. We put in with a wonderful wish list, which hopefully will still happen. So very quickly to tell you that this is the project, right? This is what Stephen created. It's a counterpoint to this very symmetrical building typically 19th century, and Stephen created something exactly the opposite of it. So, and, and representative of what we are today. Uh, but he was inspired by this beautiful conservatory on the side. So he took that small little dome that he needed, he scooped out and used that as a kind of trope. Um, and just quickly to end, um, uh, uh, India's youth form the largest segment of a 1.2 billion population. The latest UNFPA report states that India will have the largest population in the world by mid-2023, which is around the corner, overtaking China. About 45 to 50% of that population will be in the 18 to 35 age group. There is now a huge appetite for innovation in cultural practice and engaging with art has become more than just a leisure pastime for many. In fact, because of the development of the art market in recent years, longer looked upon askance as it was in earlier decades. I wanted to be an artist. I did go to the School of Art, uh, but I studied textile design because my father thought that I was going to become a hippie in the 70s. And he said, no, no, artists are not you. What, what does it mean? You, just painting is, is, is uh, I'm at the end. It, it, it doesn't have, <laughs> you know, well, that's not useful. So so you, you go and study textile design. So that's what I did. But I did go back to the Slade later. Uh, now more than ever, the idea of what museums can be is important as we stand at the threshold of massive changes through technology and communication. As we go forward into a world driven by algorithms, into a social space where the real and virtual merge, we need spaces that can be reassuring and safe and yet at the same time provocative and productive. 
Ultimately, the goal of the museum must be to build a sense of empathy and community and togetherness, to encourage curiosity and engender respect for others to shape a happier and safer world. Thank you, friends. Do, do I take questions now? Yes. So thank you for your patience and for listening to me. Are there any questions? Thank you so much for such an interesting presentation. I learned so much. Um, I just wanted to ask, reflecting on our field, which is uh, so uh, filled with so many wonderful women, I wondered how gender perspectives uh, were played a role in your work over this 20 year period in, in creating the new museum or recreating the museum. Yes, that's a very important question. Gender is absolutely an issue. Um, I, I think it's an issue across the world. I think women always have uh, a much harder time uh, trying. You have to work 10 times harder than men to get there. Um, yes, it did play a role. Um, sometimes people don't take you seriously. They think, you, oh, you're just doing this as a pastime. I, so the work really has to speak. I really believe that very firmly that you, I worked very, very hard. And um, there were times when uh, there was a government change and political change and, and the project, in fact, the expansion plan had the sanction of one government and of course was funded also by them. And then the government changed and it went into cold storage and the opposition attacked it um, uh, and it had, a, a, and there was a lot, a lot of it has to do with, I'm sure that if I was um, a Hindu man, I'm sure that I would not have had the kind of uh, um, problems that, that, that uh, came about. Uh, I don't usually say this in public, but, uh, but it, since you asked me about gender, absolutely. Many other things, there are many other things that also um, uh, play into that, it's not into being a woman. Any other questions? Thank you so much for such an inspiring keynote um, presentation. I was wondering in terms of how you decolonize and, you know, sort of exercise that sort of VNA um, moment in the museum, because in, in the presentation that you've given, uh, most of like, the site specific work that was commissioned was sort of like, um, you know, trying to dismantle all of this colonial um, affect. So I was wondering in terms of like, was that like a conscious decision to keep and sort of like, you know, separating what is India now and what was India back when it was like, a colony? Yes, yeah, so it, basically it was looking at the way the British interpreted Indian culture, the way someone like George Birdwood, John Ruskin, etc., inter interpreted British culture. And you see that in the museum and the em emphasis and the focus was in decorative arts. So we have a magnificent decorative arts collection because it was trade oriented. They was, they, these objects went to the great exhibitions to, uh, to showcase India, but also because it, they, it could make money for, uh, for the British. There were a lot of British entrepreneurs who actually uh, developed these ateliers and worked with master craftsmen. Um, and so, yes, so it was a way, and as I said, these master craftsmen were not acknowledged. And so it was a way of acknowledging them, foregrounding their practice, finding the names of the ateliers and the craftsmen and including them. So that in the book, that is there. Uh, but that took a lot of time because the archives don't have that. So it required a huge amount of research to, to actually find this. And bringing the artist in 
uh, was also a way of juxtaposing, because as I said, the institution was contemporary. It was experimental and innovative, and that's what the kind of practice that it was showing in the 19th and early 20th century when it was being run by the British. But their understanding of what was contemporary for India was decorative arts. It was not fine art, it was not painting, it was not sculpture. It was being taught in the School of Art and there were competitions, etc., that the art societies would have, but it didn't make its way into the museum. The curators, the British curators of the museum did not privilege or bring in and say, okay, these are fantastic works, we will bring them into the museum. No, they stayed in the School of Art. They were shown at, at, the, at the exhibitions, at the Art Society exhibitions, and sometimes they were acquired, uh, but they never came into the museum because the museum was not seen as a place or the work was not seen as, uh, as befitting being in the museum. And the, and the mid, early modernist collection that we have is collected post-independence. So, so yes, there's very much, there's this conversation happening. So instead of being didactic and writing labels saying, this is what was the British were like, or this is how we were uh, identified, or we were constructed, Identity was constructed for us. That is what this amazing, U, which I said is the USP of the museum, this amazing figurine collection that we have. But these are constructed identities. And there was a lot of text that went along with it, very politically incorrect text, which I had to edit before I, 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 I put out because I tried to keep the, the content, you know, so that people understood what it was like originally. So it would help them to think about how identity was constructed for us and the ways in which we still think and that these were, you know, governmental ways. Um, uh, you, can, you can read this in many ways. These are government ways. What was happening in the, during the colonial period hasn't really stopped happening now. So, it's important to also showcase that so that people can read it. You're not being didactic and hitting, your, hitting them on the head. And if I were to hold a flag and make statements, I would be out of the museum. So how do you do it? You fly below the radar. You say all the things you want to say in, through subtle and insidious ways. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm in awe. I'm exhausted to think about all the work that you have done. I, I have a bunch of questions. Well, first of all, don't we all think we need to go to Mumbai now? Yes, yes. absolutely. Next conference in Mumbai. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, just thinking about the timetable and scale of what you accomplished, I'm curious about the budget and the and the timeline for that preservation. I'm wondering if, as you work with these contemporary artists, are you a collecting institution? And do you have a collecting policy? Uh, I think we're also, many of us at smaller institutions in awe of your visitation. And I'm wondering about whether that's repeat visitation or you think that those 5,000 people on festival days are new people every time. And could you speak a little bit about school programming? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I hope I remember all of them. So, so the visitation is at the local audience repeat visit. We've worked very hard on repeat visitation. We also are very fortunate to be right next to the botanical garden and the zoo. And that is how a lot of museums in India and in several parts of the world that were that were colonies, and I'm sure in Australia and places like that, that they were studying the flora and the fauna together. And man was part of the fauna. <laughs> you know, it was uh, you were one of the animal species that were being studied. Um, so, uh, so yes, so we, so our visitation uh, is, is is make a huge effort. We have very strong digital programming, and people love coming because the building itself. So that was part of it. Uh, museums are called Ajayb Ghar in India. Ajayb is magical, strange. What are these places? Because for when the museums were set up in the 19th century by the British, 
people didn't understand what were these grand buildings. The only grand buildings they would have seen earlier would have been temples or palaces. What was this <coughs> place that they were being invited to come in and see? Um, and so they were called Adeb Ghar. And Adeb also means house of magic. So strangeness, magic. So I like to think of that the museum is a house of magic and that you basically, you come in and as you saw, you come into a completely different world and uh, and uh, I'm being shown the red card. Uh, so, I, I, so 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 it, it is many repeat visits and many, uh, we work with tour operators, et cetera, to bring in tourists. Um, in terms of funding, uh, our, uh, uh, we we have a corpus which has been given by the government, but that takes care of maintenance and salaries. Um, at times when, as I said, there were times when we um, when there was change of government, we have suffered as a result of that. Our donor um, uh, they, uh, have been amazing, amazing. They have been a moral support as well as uh, financial support. And part of it has to do with the fact that uh, the people really have responded to the institution and, and are excited about, about coming to the museum and love the museum. So I think that that is really what has uh, kept us going. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.